Hey everyone, Adam here, So is your Podcast. I have another interview for you today. I got to sit down with Tara Naomi, and I hope I said her name right because I know I got it wrong in the interview, which is embarrassing, and I literally just listened to it to make sure I didn't get it wrong. So, Tara, if I'm dead, I'm really sorry. I'm trying. Anyway, this was a really cool one for me. Tara is a cinematographer. I never actually got to sit down and have a conversation with a cinematographer, so it was cool to get at least a little bit into how things happen. You know, when you're kind of a casual movie fan or a younger movie fan, you just assume the director's doing everything, they're holding the camera, maybe there's some microphones around, whatever. The cinematographers really make the movie look how they look. Usually, of course, under direction of the, the director, but the cinematographer is an awesome job, it's an important job. I wanted to dive even deeper than we did. Tara was kind enough to put it in civilian terms for us so we could understand what she was talking about. We did talk a little bit after we recorded, uh, where she was saying that she didn't want to go super into it to kind of ostracize the listener. Uh, I personally would have loved to dive deep in, so we've talked a little bit about maybe trying to link up again and go even deeper into the world of cinematography, which would be fantastic. But of course, Tara's very busy. We'll have to see if we can make it happen. We're going to give it a shot, but at least we have this interview, so enjoy. Hey everyone, Adam here, so was your podcast. I'm sitting down with Tara Naimi. Did I say it? It's Taraniami. <laughs> Taraniami, sorry. I, I always mean to ask before I press record and then I look like a fool every time. <laughs> it's totally okay. It's All right. Uh, well, how you doing, Tara? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing good. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. Uh, you do have a new movie out and we'll definitely get there. Uh, but I always like to ask creative people to go back to the beginning of their creative journey and kind of how you got into show business and especially... I mean, I talked to a lot of actors, directors, but I've never talked to a cinematographer, so I'm really excited to dive into that whole thing. So if you don't mind kind of talking about how you got started. Yeah, um, well, there are a few places I could start. So obviously, as per Remy Niami being the director of, of this film, I Without a Face, who is my father, I grew up around filmmaking. So when I was um, a kid, I grew up around his film sets and uh he was teaching film also and my um my mother is an entertainment lawyer and so I grew up with it all around me not really understanding like what cinematography was for for a while I just kind of thought like directors did everything <laughs> um <Right. laughs> but when I when I was in high school I started doing photography and I got really, really into photography, which kind of eventually led me into cinematography. And I started like reading more about cinematography um, in college, shooting my own like no budget art house, artsy experimental films that I directed and shot and stuff. And I just realized I loved making images in motion, telling stories, um, and that still images weren't enough for me so I wanted to be a cinematographer so yeah it was kind of transition from still images to moving image and but also kind of inevitable that I'd end up working in film because I grew up with it around me and I feel like <laughs> right. even if my parents had tried to stop me from going into the film industry it was just bound to happen Right. Well, that's cool. It's, it's a different experience that a lot of people get where they want to go into film and their parents are like, that's not a real job. Become an accountant. <laughs> yeah, no, I I say this. And yet at the same time, I think they would have probably been happy for me to do a more regular job because they're like, well, you're going to do it. It is tough. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, you really got to make your own way in that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you find that uh, the still photography knowledge you got when you decided to switch over to video and cinematography that there was some carryover, like maybe in composition or how to find like an interesting angle or make something look, you know, scale or whatever? Yeah, I definitely think um, that my background in photography was very beneficial as a cinematographer because composition, camera angles, lighting, color, all of that stuff applies to both mediums. I think the thing that was the biggest change for me was literally the, uh, the movement aspect, both of like the camera movement and the movement within the frame. Like when you're working in still photos, you know, the, I, the idea of a story or motion is completely different 
You know, the image could be taken like before or after something happens or there's some idea that there's movement. And then suddenly in cinematography where you're telling a story, you might have the camera physically move or, you know, you're capturing something as it's happening and have sh that shot from different angles. So it's just like I had to get used to that. Like at first when I started making little videos and didn't really know how to make films, I was like, should I? keep the camera static or like at first I just kept keeping it still and then was like I guess I should have some wind in the shot of like a field or wait should I move it and then I moved it too much like I had to find <laughs> the balance because it was going from like total stasis to wait this is really a different way of making images so there's a lot of overlap but um but then there's a lot of difference too so you kind of have to like pick and choose what's useful between the two that does make sense i also thought it was funny that you mentioned that uh you just assume the director did everything because i think a lot of people who you know even like casual movie fans probably assume that the director's the guy who says action is holding the camera captures it all and says okay great and move on to the next thing um and it's definitely not usually the case so the job as a cinematographer part of it is you're helping tell the story. Is that correct? Yeah. So a cinematographer is the right-hand person of the director. Well, you could say the producer is as well, but kind of in a different way. We're the right-hand person in terms of visual storytelling. So the director, you know, has this vision of the story that they're telling and how they want it to feel, how they want it to look. And then our job is to work with them to translate that into like, how exactly are we going to make that happen? Like when you want it to look bright and colorful, like what kind of lighting can I do and color, you know, in camera can I do to, to bring that to life? Or, oh, we want like this moody look and they're communicating that they want, you know, shadows and, and this sort of thing. Like, it's it's an artistic and it's a technical job um so it's about both like literally practically finding a way to make what they envision happen and then we're collaborating with them discussing like how the shots of the actors etc could communicate what they're going for and how how we could position the camera how we could use light you know in this way um but i think that the reason that uh, myself as a kid, or literally most people in the world who don't work in film think that a director does everything is because there are great on-set photos of them next to the camera. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. And, stuff. <laughs> and I've been um, a production still photographer. That's kind of how I started out in terms of like industry work, like photographing the actors for publicity photos or behind the scenes photos. Um, and the directors do always want a photo of them by the camera, you know, because they are looking at the camera to see the shots. It's just uh, it reads to people as like, oh, they must have done everything. <laughs> and they're right. actually other yeah. people doing some of those jobs with them. <laughs> That's funny, because especially like a lot of directors, you'll say like, oh, it's, you know, this guy's visual style. Like, I know how he shoots things, but he's not really shooting it or, or she is not really shooting it. Yeah, well, it, it it's hard to distinguish because also some directors are extremely technical and really knowledgeable in regards to cinematography in a way that not every director is. And I say that because there's people talk about there are actor directors that are really just driven by like script and directing great performances and sort of like leave it to the cinematographers to make evocative images or whatever within that style because all their attention is on performance um and then there are people like david fincher for example who knows a lot about cinematography and could probably shoot his films himself and uses incredible cinematographers like no doubt about it darius Konji shot um seven is a genius um but he also really really understands cinematography and is from what I know, like highly particular <laughs> about lenses and stuff. So I think there is, um, it's it's not totally untrue when people say, oh, this director has this visual style or their shots or something, because it is their film. It's just that they have other collaborators. And sometimes people don't know that the DP might have come up with a lot of ideas that 
were used in the film, but it's not really like our place to be like, we did that. <laughs> right. Yeah. You're I, get the job I done. thought of that shot. The director right. did it. It's, like, <laughs> it's the director's vision and that's what we're bringing to life. So we're the unsung, you know, artists on the, on the film crew. For sure. Yeah. Did, did you find as you were learning cinematography and especially when you started working in it, do you watch movies differently now? Oh, definitely. It's really hard for me to turn off my cinematographer brain. It's actually annoying sometimes. You can't just <laughs> like get a, lost in the movie. Yeah, I'll I'll be watching something and go, oh, that, interesting, that color grade. It's very desaturated when they go into the flashbacks. Hmm, would I have done that? And I'm like, what am I? I'm trying to watch a Netflix show for fun. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with me? Um, yeah, that's cool, but, yeah, I have to, it's hard to turn that off. Sometimes I have to be like, I just want to watch something and forget about how people technically make things. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it enriches my experience interacting with art because I get excited about stuff. If I watch a really good looking show or something, I want to know who shot it and how they shot it. Like, I'm a total nerd. I'm a tech art nerd and when I like something I want to know how people did it and I'll read about like how they lit it what cameras they used you know like what the situation was like I'll look at behind the scenes photos I I want to understand other people's processes so I, I you kind of have to I think be a nerd to be a cinematographer really um you you have to want to like know things and learn about technology or learn about um the technical aspects like just as much as like it's fun being on movie sets but <laughs> right it, really it also seems like a job that's nerdy about it <laughs> yeah i'm sure because it seems like a job that's constantly changing too like evolving all the time yeah and there it's uh it can be really hard to keep up with honestly like all the new technology I actually, I've over the years and um, I got an email about it because I've gone to multiple Cinegear conventions in the past, but about like the new Cinegear this fall and the COVID guidelines for that, there's a convention that cinematographers and camera assistants and people go to called Cinegear where you see like new equipment and can try it out basically. Uh, but it's, you know, gear is basically a part it's like the means to the end sort of thing and so it's like it both doesn't mean that what you use is going to be uh the end product of like the quality of the thing someone can shoot something not good on the best gear ever <laughs> you know or shoot something great on something that didn't cost that much but it's but you do have to kind of understand the things that you're working with so that you know, like how you can push them and use them to your advantage. Um, so it's kind of this like weird thing where it's like, it's not the most important thing, but it is also important. Um, mm. But there is artistry involved and not just the camera being fancy and pressing record and it does a good job, you know? Yeah. You're, you're really not going to remove the human factor, no matter how good the tech gets. It, exactly. But yeah. the tech is always changing and it is important to stay on top of it somehow. <laughs> Have you done a lot of work on um, like very super special effects heavy movies where like it's an actor in pajamas on a green screen? No, I actually I come from and we did this a lot on Eye Without a Face. I come from doing more like practical in camera stuff. So okay. there there isn't. I mean, I guess things I've worked on in the past, there have been some like um, VFX after, but they've mostly been small things like to hide a cable or like like things like we couldn't control an aspect. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I come from doing things in camera and I guess I've just like continually gotten work that's doing things in camera and making it look, you know surreal or um or feel like oh they must have done that on a green screen but i have i know how to shoot on a green screen and stuff i just like it would be interesting i haven't yeah, done it yet i imagine it's a much <laughs> different process because you kind of you can't frame it exactly as you would traditionally i wouldn't think yeah i think the closest thing i've gotten to that is i shot some fashion video stuff that was used in an interactive sort of fashion art presentation and the artists 
who directed the video that I shot, there were effects on my footage um, that kind of transformed it and I could semi-anticipate, but it wasn't the traditional like green screen and you know what's going in there. It was sort of like more experimental. So I had a sense of what might happen there or like, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't so both bare and planned like yeah. green screen work, which is its own creature. <laughs> it's like its own, its own uh, way of cinematography and working. And That's interesting. Very it, like real. You know. it, it sounds like you have to drive across a parking lot blindfolded. Like you see the other end, you know how to get there. Then you got to put on the blindfold and, and make it happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. We should probably get to eye without a face. Um, you were the cinematographer on it, as you mentioned, and your dad was a director. So that's cool that you got to work with family or not cool, depending on how the experience went. You don't have to. <laughs> no, it went it went well enough that we're planning to continue to work together in the future. So awesome. I would say it went well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you mentioned that there was also a little bit of special effects work that you did in that. Yeah, there was um, there was some some um some effects actually a lot of it was in camera um on set so i mean this film is about a hacker um who's hacked into people he doesn't know but thinks he knows uh on a personal level's webcams and it was complicated to shoot because i had to shoot both like the actor who's the protagonist of the movie but also what he sees um which is all of these young people in their different places through the perspective of what their webcam would see. So uh, the film was shot, first of all, like on three different cameras, uh, one of which was specifically for webcam, one of which was like the majority of the movie. And the other is like the perspective of the elusive killer who is in this film, who is filming the people that they're uh, killing. Um, and that was a GoPro, uh, which was fun. Um, but it was, uh, it was interesting because we did a lot of it in real life. So like a lot of movies like this, you might have someone interacting with a green screen, you know, like, like they're reacting to what they're seeing, except the actor is not actually seeing it on set and you put it in after. But in, in, in this film, Ramin thought it was really important to have like a really good performance from the lead to have them actually interact with with what they're interacting with in real life. So we shot the webcam stuff first and played it back. And it was the first time he was seeing it. Um, and he was actually interacting with, with the footage. And there was a lot that I did too, in terms of in camera of like degrading the image and making it feel like both, you know, webcams are pretty good now, but then also like when it's dark in someone's place that you can't see very well and it gets grainy and pixelated like it really would when you use a webcam. Um, so there was a lot of that, like figuring out like how much of this can I do in real life and then how much of it do we need to do later? Um, how like how distorted and things uh, do we need it to be? But we did a lot of like what people would assume would be done with green screen in camera like the majority of the stuff that people would think would be done that way. I did like practically. That's awesome. Movie. Yeah. It was hard though. It was it sounds really incredibly hard, hard. <laughs> really hard for the digital technician person putting together footage and for playing it back. And the, yeah, it was, it was a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, it sounds it. And, and even just the the little bit, you're kind of like giving us like a scratching the surface view of this is making me think about the last few movies I watched and how that stuff all comes into play. You know, you always try to be aware, but it, it's, it's it's a it's a it's a complicated thing. And a lot of um, it's weird because this movie is coming out during, you know, pandemic whatever you want to call it COVID times and where zoom and FaceTime and everything has become ever more relevant. And so I also just think like, uh, in, you, you can see it in some of the TV and stuff that's come out this year, but I think we're going to just see even more of people like Skyping and zooming and FaceTiming in movies and shows. Mm -hmm. And then you think about like the side of like the people who are actually making it, they have to put in all the work of figuring out how to either practically or in VFX after create the look of someone FaceTiming. 
<laughs> yeah, there's a ton of extra work to kind of make it look down. Yeah, for us to bit. just <laughs> consume the Netflix show where a character FaceTimes their mom or something. Like, right. There's all this work that went into like doing that. Yeah, sitting on the couch, <laughs> it's like a three minute shot, and you're like, all right, the person talked to their mom on the computer. I do that all the time. No big deal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But in this movie, it just happened to be like a lot of the movie, <laughs> like the majority of the movie was that, um, which was really fun. Honestly, I love challenges. So when things are hard, they're fun. Yeah. Me. Yeah. Well, like you said, you're you're super into it. It's not just a job for you. So you love doing it. So I'd imagine the challenge keeps it interesting instead of uh, going to set up the camera. Like, I don't know, maybe shooting a new show is probably pretty basic as far as cinematography goes. Yeah, this was fun because it's um, psychological horror thriller and the cinematography is important in terms of building mood and making oh, people yeah. creeped out or confused or like, what is going on? Like, where am I? What is this? You know, the images are so much a part of that. So it's really fun because I get to like, you know, I got to play around and do weird things, which Rumin liked. <laughs> like he wanted it to look weird and moody and you know so yeah so you get to create a lot of the look of a horror movie which like you said are some of the moodiest and like tone is everything literally everything i mean because if you're if you're looking at you know if you're watching something that's supposed to be creeping you out and it doesn't look that creepy you know you're like okay where's the creepiness then that mm. it kind of uh it makes it less of a satisfying experience. Um, so yeah, tone is everything. And that's where like cinematography comes into play because it's, you know, what, how the shot is composed, what the angle is, how the camera is moving, the light and shadow. And I, and in this, there's a lot of intention behind when things look off or weird, like, that was, you know, intentional. So, so even if you don't notice it, you're like, something feels weird. You know? <laughs> I feel like of it's a cinematography. <laughs> right. I feel like your job is one of those where like when it's done right, people don't notice your job. But when it's done wrong, it's like, oh, people notice. <laughs> exactly. That's that's the hope is that people don't notice anything I did on this. Right. <laughs> and it might be later that they're like, wait a second, like backwards. Oh. There was that shot, I, you know, but like yeah. in the woman, I'd hope that people are just absorbed by the story and the emotions and are like, you know, caught up in that and forget about that someone was behind the camera filming this. That's my hope. <laughs> As Absolutely. Don't remember that there was a cinematographer on this. Yeah, <laughs> that's a it's a double bladed sword there, right? <laughs> Well, very cool. Uh, well, Tara, thank you for taking the time to come on. Um, do you want to tell everyone where they can see I Without a Face? Yeah, so people can see I Without a Face in the U.S. and Canada on all major streaming platforms. So Amazon, Prime, iTunes, Apple TV, Google Play, all, all of the places that you can rent movies on, basically. You can very rent cool. it now. And if you like it, you know, say what you like about it. <laughs> <laughs> Leave a review. It helps. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And also, if you have any other uh, websites or your socials, anything else you want to plug anywhere yeah. else you want to point people? Yeah, so our movie has a website, and it's just iwithoutaface.com. Um, it has the trailer, reviews, press, cast and crew list, all that jazz. And um, there's, uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember the social media accounts, but um, iwithoutaface21 on Instagram is... Um, the Instagram and then I without a FAC number eight on Twitter. Uh, someone had taken the I without a face with an E. So, you know, I had to, <laughs> we had to get crafty. Right. Um, but really the website is probably like the best way to s just like see stuff to do with the movie. Cause it, it has all the information that you need basically. Awesome. Well, thanks again for coming on. i um, looking forward to getting into more of your work in the future. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. I'd like to thank Tara one more time for coming on the show to talk to us about cinematography, her career. It's awesome. Make sure you like and subscribe. We have a lot more new movie coverage, a lot more interviews, some unboxings, a lot more cool stuff coming your way you're not going to want to miss out. Like and subscribe. Tell your friends. Also, make sure you listen to So Is Your Podcast every single week, wherever you get your podcasts. 
So Wizard Podcast can also be found on Patreon, where for as little as $1 a month, you get multiple monthly bonus shows. So wizardpodcast.com is your resource for reviews, recommendations, merchandise, videos, and more. And we love hearing feedback. Drop some note in the comments, leave us something on social media. All the accounts can be found after the show and in the show notes. And on a more personal note, a really good friend and I have an ongoing comedy comic series. It's called Social Studies. It's a slice-of-life comedy comic about the high school experience, told through the prism of the 90s cartoons that grew, that we grew up on and inspired us and everything we're doing. Currently, we are running a crowdfunding campaign. Very cool. We kept the prices very low for a ton of content. It's a great place to jump on board our first chapter before chapter two kicks off in a few months. You can find all the information for that at socialstudiescomic.com. If you're listening to this in the future, when the crowdfunding campaign is over, still go to socialstudiescomic.com because there's tons of awesome stuff. Even if you can't contribute monetarily, Spread the word. I would really appreciate it. Thank you.